Hi, Kate. Hi, Shiva. Welcome to Soul Brews with Shiva. I'm so delighted to have you on Coffee and Soul. Thank you so much for making the time, Kate. And thank you so much for having me, Shiva. It's a, it's a privilege and I'm, I'm absolutely del delighted to host you, Kate. Yeah, my side too. A, a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have your cup of coffee ready with you? I do have my cup of coffee ready with you. <laughs> right. Yes. Good. Yeah. So I'm going to pour mine and... Ah, you know, the sound always does something. It does. Yes to life. Okay. Here's the life, here's the life. Yours is a long one, I see. In that it cup. is a long one, yeah. For yeah. me, it's morning. So for me, it's um, a short, yeah. sharp one. Yeah. Welcome. It's a delight Thank to have you. you here. Cheers. Ah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> what would life be without coffee? Exactly. Exactly. I wonder often. Yet I'm going to ask you to just hold that cup of coffee in your hands if you don't mm -hmm. mind and just nestle nestle it between your palms and can I ask you to just relax and sit back and breathe and breathe yeah just relax that's lovely and as you relax see if there's anything that comes up for you in the form of a thought or a sound or a a picture, anything that you view or hear or feel along with this warmth seeping in. Well, Shiva, you won't be very surprised to hear that um, since I'm holding coffee, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, I'm also able to get the lovely aroma of the coffee. Um, it's making me think. It's making me think of life before lockdown. Mm. And it's making me think it's um, just about a year or maybe a little longer even, mm. longer, um, since the last time I was in central London. I live a little outside mm. London. And one of my main reasons for going to central London was actually to buy my coffee there's a lovely old um, I'm not sure if I'm able to advertise places on your on your podcast if you, you can you can do anything you want so oh, okay right. great great yeah there's a there's a wonderful place in Soho called the um, Algerian coffee shop I don't know if it has anything to do with Algeria in its history but it has the most lovely um, coffees teas um, coffee really? making equipment from all over the world so it's a pleasure to go there in itself but also it evokes um, it evokes something that is of a previous world mm. something that's mm. not possible now and uh, probably won't be possible in the same way for some time to come mm. um, I don't think that's a bad thing mm. It's just a, a memory. You know, the, the smells, the smells yeah. are often what emo evoke yeah. memories yeah. more than anything. And the smell of coffee, I had never thought of that until this morning. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 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 Well, what did that place mean for you? What did it, what, what did it signify, Kate? The Algerian um, coffee shop. It was a lovely place in itself. It was such a great place to go to. And um, no place to sit and drink coffee there, but oh, everyone really? just goes and gets their little little cup while they're um, choosing their coffees, having a chat, having it packed up. So the experience was uh, lovely in itself. Um, I would make time to go deliberately there, um, but also it brings up it brings up um, how much the world has changed oh. in the last uh, in the last year. And we're all doing quite, quite different things now. Very different things. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, and 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 just so keeping with this, uh, what you're reflecting on, Kate, before the lockdown, with uh, going through the pandemic and the lockdown, now going forward, but a lot before that as well. It'd be lovely to hear about your journey, and uh, you know, just just. Uh, your highs and lows, how life has been for you. As and I'd love to hear uh, 
uh, your, your your flow uh, in life with life uh, how, um, you know some of your defining moments and, um, would love i'm sure my viewers would also love to hear from you so yeah well i'm not sure um, i'm not sure how interesting it is but it's always lovely to be able to um, speak about people's lives and their stories and um, as a coach i get to hear a lot um, and then sometimes not to not to share a lot so very happy to very happy to share with you Love. Sheba. Love so i'm um, sitting here now in um, south london on the other side of the screen speaking to you and do you know i don't even know that you exist i have no tangible proof that you exist you mm. could be um you could be an avatar in mm. a computer game mm. um i don't think you are but it's always possible <laughs> <laughs> but here we, here we are <laughs> life gives us these possibilities um so um my my story has not always been in in south london um i've moved around a lot mm. And that's probably been a, a defining uh, part of, of my life. Um, I come, as um, I think we said before, I come from an Anglo-Indian family. Mm. And I'm um, super proud of that, really super proud of that. And you have every reason to be. I have every reason to be. I'm super proud of my roots, yeah, yeah. I wish I could cook and Anglo-Indian food better. <laughs> I wish I could dance better. I wish I could sing better. And I wish I could tell better jokes, but uh, <laughs> I am super proud of the Anglo-Indian roots. Uh, my dad's family are from Mumbai. Um, mainly the boys would um, join what was then the um, Merchant Navy. Oh. Um, and um, the careers were generally um, doctors or engineers. Uh, many of them were engineers, that was my dad's story. So my dad was at sea. Um, Met my mum in um, in a port city. Mm -hmm. uh, married my mum. I was I was born here. And, and your mom, mom is from from London. My mum is from the north of England. That's north a, of England, it, yeah. called, um, it was a big port in those days. A port called Hull. Um, mm. I think it still is a a fairly functional port. It's still mm. known as a port city. Um, and I think they also did some. Um, uh, education programs there for um, the, the the sea uh, okay. community. So my mum and dad went, went there. My dad wanted to be a doctor. Um, he couldn't be a doctor. So when he left the Navy, the next best thing, um, he, uh, he joined the National Health Service and okay. had a career initially in engineering and then into, into management from there. And he spent most of his career in there. Um, well, that's so interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. I I remember I do remember the time I first became really aware of my Anglo Indian roots, and that was also the time that I became aware of the big themes of today mm -hmm. around um, diversity, inclusion, mm -hmm. racism, anti racism. Because I remember at that time it was I'm giving my age away here. It was back in the um, 60s, mm. 60s, maybe early 70s. And um, at that time, there was a lot of immigration. And when you get immigration, you get attitudes. Yeah. And one of the attitudes was um, these people, these people are coming in and taking the jobs and uh, you yeah. know, what have you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not very nice, it's not yeah. very nice. Yeah. Um, I had never thought of that before, but I remember one day I came home from school I was about seven years old, and my mom said to me, um, if anyone asks where your dad comes from, tell them you think he's from Greece or somewhere. I had no idea where Greece was and no idea where somewhere was. Mm. But I remember thinking, oh, okay, something here is different. This is why we go to my auntie's house every Sunday afternoon and play guitars and dance. And then. So I started to then um, associate um, a lifestyle and a set of values. Mm with uh, cultural heritage yeah. and um, it changed at that point. It changed at that point because I was always thinking, I was always thinking, right, so I don't quite feel a fit here. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do I do? Where do I move to? And I uh, studied um, languages, 
um, at school and at university. Um, I actually studied French and Italian at university, put my French and Italian to very good use by going immediately to Japan <laughs> as soon as I graduated. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I got into the then very new field called teaching English as a foreign language. It was super new. I think I was probably one of the early cohorts to start to um, qualify in that. Okay. In that area, I did uh, I did my um, a certificate, then a degree, and then uh, then my first master's I did in linguistics and cross cultural um, stuff. So this cross cultural stuff. Tell me more about it. Uh, of Obviously, the roots are uh, at what you just said. Ascribe you ascribe them perhaps to the fact that you know different cultures are a part of your life, right, from the very very early on. So, is is that something that you see as a theme going through your life? And it's very much um, it, it's bordering on a passion. Um, oh. I'm not a super passionate person, but it's bordering on a passion. If I had a passion, this would be this would be it. And I got interested in it uh, from the intellectual perspective um, when I was I was working in Hong Kong and I was working in um, City University, and we had a department that was, um, of course, it was very multicultural, uh, very multilingual. And I noticed that in our department, we were the Department of Languages and Communications, and um, we, were, we, uh, we functioned quite well. We got on with each other um, well. And I noticed in other departments, there were some um, tensions and um, disagreements, unproductive disagreements. And uh, I began to think, I wonder if this has got something to do with our, our background and being more uh, multilingual, multicultural. I wonder if this gives, gives us um, a, a skill set that enables us to be more productive together. So that's where I started, um, probably more of a PhD thesis than a master's thesis. So I had to narrow it down. I did have to narrow it down, but um, I, I needed a topic for my master's thesis. So I went into then the then quite new um, cultural anthropology and um, social psychology around the cross-cultural stuff. And it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So um, I was able to run, um, run uh, a, a survey within my department mm -hmm. that um, I was young at the time. I was young at the time, so I didn't know what I was taking on. Um, but I was able to run a survey and then come up with some stuff that did support the hypothesis that um, people who were coming from multicultural backgrounds and also um, had at their command more than one language mm. seemed to be able to work more creatively and productively together. So that was really uh, early on. You came up with something like this. On. Yes, it was early on. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. 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 Okay. I took it into my work. Then I did take it into my work. We did um, uh, not long after that. I was working for a service strategy consulting uh, firm that uh, it was Asia based, and we worked all over Asia. We had some lovely projects. Um, for example, um, one was about hiring um, airline crews mm. to uh, staff a particular airline that was flying international routes. And of course, in that service environment, you have um, passengers, customers from all over the world. Mm. And people have, uh, people have quite different service expectations based on the human mm. side of it, mm. um, as well as the standards side of it. Mm. And we wanted to create airline crews who could really um, work to very high standards. We had uh, Japan as one of our markets, so there we had super high service, sure, uh, service yeah. standards, yeah. Uh, but also work to, um, you know, work to the heart mm -hmm. as well, because that's why, that's why passengers would, um, would fly an airline. That's often why people are often quite loyal, even to their national yeah. airline, even if it's not very good. I speak from experience. Um, and <laughs> But people are quite are quite loyal. It's not just the points. It's the it's the um, it's the experience. So um, I used it. We we designed a program there called Soul of Asia, 
we started with Heart of Asia, but then we went to Soul of Asia. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, we ran it for um, airlines, um, some hotel groups at that time. And now when I, I sometimes see the training in those hotels and I still see parts of that program alive and well, of course, uh, adapted. Really? What's happening wow. there? Yeah, alive and well. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's amazing. So there's 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 a uh, there's a legacy there. Obviously, it worked really well and people have worked on it, tweaked it, and are continuing with that. It's amazing. Mm, mm, I hadn't thought about that before I started talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. And then after that? After what? that, let me take a sip of coffee. So after that, yeah, I couldn't put it down, you know. So after that, um, I decided that uh, uh, I had become quite good in all this stuff around um, training and process consulting, but I was really feeling, I was feeling the need for something um, real and solid like an MBA. So I, I, I did that. Um, I got a place at London Business School, which was great. Yeah. And again, I was faced with writing a dissertation for my <laughs> for my MBA thesis and um, I did the same thing um, I decided I would go back into that kind of area but the tack I took on it was um, about um, learning rather than uh, rather than service or service delivery so what was the relationship between culture and mm learning so in my first masters i'd look at oh i'm so sorry i that's all right that's all right it's all part of yeah. life it's all right yeah. it's like a sheep it's actually from you I'm yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're disturbing me i'm disturbing you i, I plead guilty <laughs> <laughs> and WhatsApp is delivering a little bit late. Um, yeah, so here's an interesting thing as well. So I had um, my first dissertation had taken me to the areas of the uh, the cross cultural um, lenses for mapping cultures. So in those days, it was Hit um, Hofstede, it was Franz Trompenas, um, it was Hampton Turner. And uh, of course, there are many others who have entered the field now. Erin um, Meyer is one of my one of my favorites. Um, but I had I had got I had worked on the the, the frameworks, yeah. and I was wondering. So, if someone wants to develop a greater um, cross cultural um, capability or a greater cultural intelligence, well, how do you do that? Yeah. And um, I was fortunate at that time to have at London Business School, uh, a colleague, um, Chris Early, who'd been working with um, Sun Ang in um, Singapore um, on precisely this. It's how do you, how do you um, assess an individual for cultural intelligence? How do you um, develop cultural intelligence um, in someone? And I thought, yes, yes, we bring these two things together. Um, so I, uh, and now there's actually a certification, there's a coach certification um, that we can do in that. It's um, David Livermore in the US. Gosh, I'm advertising a lot of people's products here, aren't I? Um, but he has made it accessible to, to a lot of coaches. It changed a little, but but made uh, made accessible. I haven't done that because I, I tend to work with the framework, with the framework in my head rather than um, via, via the tool. So there's a question that's coming up from, for me as you say this, Kate, and, and if you could, you know, uh, have, have, have an, uh, thought about that and tell me, is this interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence, would that be an important facet of cultural intelligence? In that, um, one of the... Um, so one of the facets of cultural intelligence would be that facet of um, learning to learn. Learning how to learn, yeah. And someone who has um, interpersonal intelligence is able to pick up signals mm -hmm. from, from um, the, the environments, the quite novel environments mm -hmm. that we would find ourselves in and figure it out. So mm -hmm. what's going on here? And then how do I need to be? 
mm. in that environment. So in mm. that sense, yes, yes, it links very much. It also links to, um, you know, if we think about the people that we know, Shiva, with what we would call uh, an interpersonal intelligence, they're probably quite good at things like empathy. Mm. They're probably quite good at uh, mirroring. Mm the other person and that would be the that would be the skill part mm. of cultural mm. intelligence mm. um yeah so definitely there's a link there okay right yeah. um, the other part is motivation the other yeah. part is motivation so um some people are um they don't feel capable or they don't feel motivated mm. Mm. to uh to to learn and that's fine that's mm. fine so one of the things that um that a cultural intelligence approach uh, more broadly will ask is okay what are you doing here um what what's your job are mm. you facilitating some um zoom meetings with people from different parts of the world what's their experience are they sort of multicultural folks themselves is it a multinational organization you're working with mm -hmm. right to the other other end of the scope which is um do you really want to uh you know how far do you want to really uh feel and be felt of felt as um mm -hmm. belonging to that culture a native yeah. of culture yes, so um I, I heard it described to me in a rather nice way which is um do you want to um be able to uh order local food in spain or do you want to be spanish because on the one hand you just go for a spanish phrase book and on the other hand you better go and live for four years and learn the spanish guitar and really get into the sort of culture so it's got a lot to do with the motivation uh, of the, the person which again will you know when we're learning any skills we hit we hit roadblocks yeah that's uh, particularly that's when fasc we're fascinating yeah. that's fascinating that the, and 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 i see that you know the differentiator as you say and I mean, and it makes a lot of sense, Kate, on, on uh, something that would be surface and something that would really mean getting into, yes. into the skin of the, yeah. Yes, yeah. And imagine, imagine, Shiba, if you, um, if you really wanted to belong and to be seen as belonging, if you got it wrong, you would feel it. Mm. And that feeling yeah. would be, okay, I feel bad for a moment, but hey, what can I learn from this? Mm. And you really push, you really persevere. So imagine if you're even just trying to learn a language under those circumstances, you stick at it. Whereas if you're not really very bothered, you would, you might make a mistake here and there, um, but you might not, um, you might not be uh, motivated to, to push through to persevere and either way is it, it can be okay mm. but it's important that that we we know ourselves absolutely how far we want to go and if we're learning in a class it's really important that we know i'm different and you're different to you and you're different in your motivations otherwise we tend to measure ourselves towards other people's standards and that doesn't certainly in this kind of thing that doesn't work doesn't work yeah 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 it's fascinating what you're saying and and also uh, you know opens doors into into deeper thinking on this and i think that's required particularly in the world that we live in today uh kate after, how did coaching find you or how did you find coaching what uh, I think we found each other. I think mm. we found each other. And uh, it was a life thing, uh, Shiba. So I had, um, I'd be doing a busy job. I'd been doing a busy um, consulting job. Mm. And this was after your MBA? And this was anyway. after my MBA. So then after my MBA, I joined, I joined London Business School's Executive Education um, mm. on, the, on the consulting side. So the putting together of programs, the working with clients, the design sure. before it's over, that kind of thing. And um, it was quite demanding, quite a lot of travel. And it was simply at that point, I had a young child, I had elderly parents. And while my child was getting older, um, so were my parents. And that kind of the lifestyle was absolutely not sustainable. So I began to think, okay, and oh, also, I wasn't getting any younger myself, I have to put that in. <laughs> so I, began, <laughs> I began to think um, quite practically, of work 
that rewards wisdom and doesn't punish age and uh oh, coaching comes into that comes into that category and um actually when i first trained in coaching um i wasn't sure i absolutely wasn't sure so i'm going to advertise another uh, company now um, at this point um i i chose a coaching course which was very much uh based around the idea that we the coach are the tool. And I looked at um, what their 20 day program was about. And um, when I looked at it, I thought, well, I'm not sure if I can do this. And I'm not sure if I want to do this. But my goodness, it's going to be fantastic personal development, whether I do anything with it or not. Yeah. So I did my 20 days, I um, decided, yep, yeah, I can do this. And I decided, yep, yeah, I want to do this, or at least make it a part of um, how I, I manage the, the the portfolio of my ongoing life, and and here we are. It's really been a, a journey of of discovery since then, and I have been very fortunate, very blessed in that um, coaching has found me and clients have found me, and I've been able to um, interpret what I do according to client environment and client need i can imagine what's it that you I, firstly i just want to congratulate you on that beautiful sentence it's really left a mark on me which is something that doesn't punish age and rewards wisdom and that is equal to coaching i think that's a beautiful way to look at it and it's very powerful mm -hmm. so i just wanted to underline that to say thank you for sharing that it's really i'm probably saying a lot of things that are not really very politically correct in this uh, podcast <laughs> No, there is you, the, the 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 bit about this podcast is you just 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 have to be yourself. That's it. Yeah, the masks come off. Yeah. So I hope. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, all right. And so and 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 coaching has been an enjoyable journey for you thus far. Very much. Yeah. Very much. Very much. Um, like like a lot of coaches. Um, I learn as much from my clients as they learn from me. Um, it's very rewarding when um, I find working with someone very rewarding when then they, they take that out to their own teams, out to their own organizations, out to their own families yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's nice to feel it's, it's nice to feel that kind of, it's not a massive impact, but it's nice to feel the ripples. Exactly, it's the ripples, right? And 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 that is pretty massive when it ripples out. It uh, it doesn't seem very much, but my God, what an impact mm -hmm. it does have! Um, so, as as we as we talk about your journey, what have been some of the key influences in your life, Kate? What are they? Are there people or moments that stand out? Or... I think. Um moments so uh <laughs> my first one was my seven-year-old self suddenly discovering uh that oh i'm anglo-indian that's cool um that was another one that was one i think another one was um my my first leadership experience my yeah. first real leadership experience um yeah. i was young again probably about 24 years old yeah. And um, it was at the time when there was um, quite a massive movement of um, Indo-Chinese, mainly Vietnamese yeah. refugees, into Hong Kong. Yeah. And I worked then in a, uh, a UNHCR um, transit center okay. where we were preparing people um, to, to go off to um, US, UK and Australia. So there was a language and there was a, a cross-cultural yeah. program. And... Um, you know, I, being able to start my career, uh, well, not exactly start, I'd been in Japan for a few years before then, but still at a young age, um, designing, uh, teaching, um, and making, making, supporting learning in, in that kind of environment, mm. um, it, it grounds you. Yeah. It really grounds you. I mean, people need skills because they've got lives to rebuild. Mm. Tell, me more. Tell me more. 
So if you, uh, you've lost almost everything, you've had some gold, you've given it, somewhat, given it to someone to put you and your family on a small boat, ready for a new life. You may be super educated professional. You may be, um, you may not have education. Um, you may speak the, some of the language of the country you're going to, you may not. Mm -hmm. But still, you need to go and you need to build, you need to build a new life. Mm -hmm. And so what it taught me, uh, what it taught me is it taught me to go from the rational to the emotional mm -hmm. in the learning. Um, How was that journey? I was young. Mm. I was young, and um, it was. I think it stayed with me because mm. um, I know it sounds obvious now, but at, at that age, I think I was I was designing a rational program of okay, you're going to need the skills for. Um, buying food, cooking food and eating food mm. in this new environment. You're going to need the skills for getting a new job. Um, but it doesn't stick unless you're starting with um, thinking about how the person thinks about themselves in this situation. And this is across two languages that, you know, I mean, I, this is Vietnamese. I knew very little Vietnamese other than the, you know, the Vietnamese language classes that we were, that we were having um, in the transit center. But it, it, it taught me that, um, it taught me that for someone to, to learn a skill like that and to really learn it and to really use it, you have to start with how they think about themselves. Mm. Um, and I applied that in, in a new environment when we were doing um, the training for the airline crews mm. as well. Mm. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, it, if, you're, if you're delivering service to someone, it's a very personal relationship. Yeah. And we all default, we actually default to um, how we um, deliver service in our homes. So someone comes in. It's very powerful, yeah. It, it, really, I mean, you think yeah. about if someone comes into, in, yeah. into your home, you think about how you address them. Are they going to be an auntie and an uncle or are they not? Hmm. Um, are you going to uh, make sure they eat before they leave or are you not? Hmm. Are you going to offer them something or are you going to give them something without the, without the offer of choice? All these things are very embedded in the way we are. And if, um, if I bring you into my environment and ask you to execute a service procedure that to you doesn't feel like you're looking after these people, that's going to be very difficult for you to, for you to do. And actually, my service procedure probably won't land mm. with the people maybe of your culture who you know much better than I do. Mm. So let's have a conversation around, um, around what actually the guest host relationship looks like and what makes most, what makes both of us most comfortable <clears throat> and most, um, most well served in that environment. And then we mm. can build, mm. then we can build, we can flex and, and, and adapt mm. so that you feel pride in what you in what you give and your, um, your your customer your passenger your guest feels care in mm. what they receive yeah yeah and so making making the experience translatable right translatable into actual life is and into the experience for the other person which is uh, yeah yeah absolutely and 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 so then this was one key influence in, in your life what else? Was there anything else that, or any other moments that you can think of? I think the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> we can't escape that one, can we? <laughs> oh, we can't. No, yeah, I, think, uh, I think I have, I've probably done more change in this last year of my life, yeah. been more real questioning of myself in this last year of life, more real uh, questioning of what's, what's possible and, and what's not possible in this last year of life than I had in the, I don't know, previous 10 years altogether. 
Um, and I'll give you one example of that, Shiva. I remember the, the first ever virtual um, training that I did, apart from you know these kinds of conversations sure, we've sure. been doing in, in coaching for some time. Sure. So, um, uh, although even in the coaching days, early coaching days, do you remember coaching over the Zoom? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> were frozen i mean it was painful wasn't it it was we learned, you know all, this, all the platforms they've really upped their game and yeah. we know how to flip from one to the other and to spot our phones etc so for you and i to have this conversation we don't have to think about the tech so um, that's obviously um one difference but i remember also in the um learning to um design and then learning to facilitate um online I remember again about this time last year, um, a client who trusted uh, a team of us said, well, um, you can't come to Amsterdam, obviously, because we're locked down. So do you want to try virtual? And we said, yes. <laughs> um, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into, but hey, you know, we went into it and we had to learn the platform from the start. But I remember, I remember reading an article that said, Okay, when it comes to training, you can do um, content mm. online, easy, but you can't do the socio-emotional online. And I thought, oh no, what have I let myself into? Because the whole of this program, it was, a, it was sure. interpersonal. It was all socio-emotional. There was mm. very little content. Mm. So I thought, okay, is it too late to change our minds? Um, yeah, so let's just go for it. So what we did is we did um, we did some things to make it safe. So you know if you're if you're facilitating um, on site with a group of people, you can take people to really the edge of their comfort zones, and um, you can catch it if um, if 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 things go further than you think yeah. you've got the space you can catch people you're going to see them at lunch you're going to see them at dinner etc virtual people just flip off their screens and you don't know what they're going into you don't know what they've come from you don't know what they're going into i remember a conversation we had on that one and you had shared something as well you know, yes the just went blank yeah go ahead kate yeah. yes we did I, I remember that too yes and um you know we really don't know what's mm what happens there. So what we did in this, my first ever program was we said, okay, we'll play it safe. Um, all the exercises we'll do, we'll make them contained. So we can mm. always predict mm. three or four outcomes and then we know we can contain them. So we really, really played safe. Mm -hmm. And then at the end we thought, okay, so what do we do to wrap up the program? And you know, you know, when you're facilitating, we usually end with maybe everybody making a commitment or, or, yeah. or something like that, you know, some kind yeah. of closure. So we decided that for the closure, we would have everybody giving each other a virtual um, gift. Okay. So it was rather like, um, I don't know, are you familiar with a secret Santa? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. A mystery yeah. buddy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. One of my colleagues was very good at, um, at um, understanding the dynamics with the group. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Kate would give to Shiva, she will give to Manbir, Manbir will give yeah. to da, 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 da. So, you know, we, at least we were giving to people that we had had uh, experience with. So we asked them to do that. We gave them um, 10 minutes to go off. It was deep lockdown. So it was literally mm -hmm. go into your house mm -hmm. or if you're lucky enough to have a, a garden, go there, bring something mm -hmm. and um, that will be your, your, your gift. To the next person in the in, in oh, the that's line. beautiful. And yeah. It's a gift going forward, so right, to encourage right. them um, on their on their journey. And the gift people got for each other were amazing. The insight that they had mm. shown, and these were people who had met each other only two dimensionally online, amazing. and they had spent. Um, People were moving around around in groups, but I think they had spent probably a maximum of 10 hours in the company of that person. Um, and amazing. in that time, they were able to oh. discern the essence of that person and what to give them, <laughs> what to give them as a gift going forward. It was <laughs> what a wonderful creature the human being is, isn't it? That's... I know. 
So the idea that you can't do socio-emotional online, um, and I know many people have since discovered this, this isn't a massive discovery, but many people have said the same thing, but that was a big influential moment for me um, sure. online. Sure. Yeah, and it, 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 and it really must have moved the needle in terms of what you could offer and it would go down well and the confidence of, yes, it can happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. you know, when you say that, Sheba, I think, um, I think a lot of people have benefited from that. Yeah. Because there was a moment when um, some of my clients, at least, I don't know about yours, um, were quite nervous of virtual and almost stopped. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful to be able to say, no, no, I've experienced this. It works. Mm -hmm. We can do that. And to offer that personal reassurance that we've done it. These were the scores. This was the feedback. It wasn't just us that were saying it was it was good. Um, we had feedback to show yes, this works. And That's fantastic. Through the pandemic, let's do it anyway. And it's probably quite supportive for people. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. It would be right because then they can fall back on it and say, okay, let's give it a shot and let's work. With let's it. give it a shot, and yeah. and we learn a lot, and we get together in um, exactly in in really helpful ways. Yeah. Um, and of course, with a with a pandemic, for some people, um, their jobs, their are parts of the jobs that they can't do. So they have, they do have a bit of uh, spare time. Mm -hmm. And what better way of using that time than to invest in your learning? Absolutely. And and Kate, just moving forward on this conversation, that's wonderful what you've just shared. And in terms for people to also understand where, uh, how 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 quickly we can adapt to a completely different, a completely new environment and give people the kind of experience that doesn't that kind of moves them away from feeling isolated to being connected again in another way uh, is there so just moving this forward is there when the chips are down or things are not going really well is there an is there is there a fallback metaphor you have or an adage that you live by Oof. or many uh, maybe a few i mean that's whatever Comes up. Yeah, um, the one that comes to mind often is the uh, it's the old um, it's 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 attributed to Einstein, and I'm not even sure it's um, it's an I, in fact I think it probably isn't, but it's that one about um, you can't solve a problem from the same level of yes. thinking that created it. Mm. So you got to go either a level deeper or a level higher. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you have to go down or up. And I think that's very powerful. I love the way you did that, that Shiba, a level deeper. And often, um, sometimes, sometimes you need to go um, sort of up into the system and think about the systemic influences. And sometimes you need to go down deep into the body and the wisdom of the body. So it's up, up and deep, but it's very rarely at the same level. It, it is very rarely at the same level that, 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 that we created it, because that keeps us in the same the same kind of um, cognitive loop. yes yes and and and, and uh, in terms of when you're looking at people Kate uh, who have we're just starting out in their lives right now and uh, probably a younger Kate or or someone on a similar kind of a journey or people that you see is there is there a message that you have for them is there something that you'd tell them from where you are today to say 20 years before? Um, well, thinking about the young people that I know, uh, this is going to sound very much like an old person speaking to a young person, but it's a, it's a, it's a do it now message. Mm -hmm. um, if there's something, it's an impulse that's saying, um, this is what this is what I want to do. This is what I feel called to do. This is what um, just do it now. Do it now. Don't put it off. Do it now. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful case because it's so easy to say I'll do this tomorrow or is it good or is it and wait to ratify it. And what I'm hearing you say is that uh, and tell me if I'm is that don't wait to get it validated if it's a strong impulse to it. Am I correct in that understanding? Yes, I, 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 I think so, yes. And, and in, you know, in doing things, um, we get some movement and then we start to, start to learn. Um, I don't want to make it sound like um, a very sort of action-orientated kind of, of doing. Um, sometimes um, stand back, reflect, be patient wait 
is really important. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about this kind of um, hesitation, um, the he hesitation, um, hesitation is probably not helpful. If you're hesitating, just, just, just do it. If it's meant to be stopped and reflected on, then, then do that. But the hesitation um, takes time, energy, and it's not helpful. Great. Thank you. I think that's that's a very strong message and it's hugely helpful for people to kind of not just walk uh, on two logs, but just you know, take, take, take the leap. Is, is that your metaphor, Shiva? Two logs? <laughs> Something, Something really? like that. <laughs> I like that one. Can I have it? <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh... Kate, I believe every individual, each one of us has a unique gift to offer to people, to humankind. What is yours? Something oh. that only you do, that no one else mm -hmm. And it's true, it's true. Um, I'm not sure I'm unique because um, the population of the world is very large. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm unique, but I think we can all be unique in the various situations that we find ourselves in, that we that we show up in. And um, so I, I, I find it quite hard to take life very, very seriously. And as you know, <laughs> <laughs> thank God for that. <laughs> and um, I've got a strong streak of rebellion. So um, I, I, I like to challenge situations when they don't make sense. And that's a strength, that's a real strength. And is that is that something that you find that kind of influences the outcome because people haven't looked at it in a particular manner? And when you bring that up, it probably does a little bit of disruption, which is required. Do you see that happening, Kate? It's often voicing voicing things that people yeah. uh, that people are thinking, mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason, um, you know, people have people have um, lives to take care of as well. People have their mortgages to pay. People have their reputations to take care of, and sometimes we don't say stuff. So it's it's quite nice when someone who's um, a bit older just <laughs> comes and says it. <laughs> so it's often voicing something that's in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that is a gift. That is a real gift to 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 be able to do that. So that everybody kind of breathes after that to say, "Oh my God, thank God, I didn't say it. She did." So, but but it's out there. So. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to say, Kate? Um, what else? Thank you, thank you very much, Shiva. It's not often we have the opportunity to um, just to, to chat over coffee. Um, I've noticed you haven't been drinking your coffee, so I hope it hasn't gone cold. <laughs> I've been drinking some off and on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this uh, for this wonderful uh, conversation and, and, and for the openness, Kate, and also for reflecting on your life and how it's been, and particularly all the things you brought about. Um, I hope you continue to voice out the things that people don't find it easy to voice and to and therefore make it easier for all of us to walk a different path and um, thank you so much for making the time it's been an absolute delight to speak with you thank you so much for having me Sheba the pleasure is mine and it should be me thanking you for your time and I hope you will continue um, with this podcast and speaking to your fantastic guests I I love to listen um, it's it's a delight thank you thank so you. much thank you very much and you take care, Kate. You take care too. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.